Hey guys, so 10 years ago I got scammed trying to buy this motherboard. So this is what happened and this was 10 years ago. We are on the Vintage Computer Federation forums and January 2014, V Westlife, he runs a retro themed YouTube channel. He posted about finding this motherboard online through a website which is sort of an agent that lets foreign buyers buy from the Chinese website Taobao, which is a huge online shopping website. And down here, this is me. I used to go under a different username. I'm linking a forum thread from Vogons with a very similar looking motherboard. And I was really, I love this board. It, 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 it's minimalistic and it works without any dramas. I've been using this board in many of my videos. And yeah, we keep discussing the project. And then here I'm saying, well, I took a punt. It's cheap enough to risk it. But unfortunately, as we keep going down further onto the next page, I think it's all the way at the bottom. Let me just find it. Unfortunately here, yeah, I totally forgot about this board. The board never arrived. And I did contact the seller, but yeah, no answer. They just ghosted me and I never got my money back. Recently, I saw this main board advertised online and I immediately recognized it. So I didn't hesitate. I bought it straight away. So let's check out what it can do. It's very compact, minimalistic. I really like that. And that was the reason, well, one of the reasons why I really wanted this main board. And we have six ISA slots here, BIOS, chipset, processor, maths coprocessor which you can upgrade memory goes here coin cell battery this is probably the keyboard controller keyboard goes here power supply goes over there and down below here we have some jumpers this is the retro web website and this main board it does have an entry there's some information also some photos to look at but it didn't have a bios to download so I pulled out my programmer, dumped the BIOS and I submitted it to the website. There's some information about the chips, but in terms of documentations, there's nothing available. It's not a big loss because this motherboard is so minimalistic. It's not difficult to figure out how to use it. This is the model number DAT4030 revision 1.10 and we can see the company name here, yeah, designed by ALD. This is the BIOS chip. I removed it, I used a programmer, dumped the BIOS and I've submitted it to the retro web. So other people can use it if they need to. Here we can see a frequency table. So there are some jumpers down below here, just underneath the processor. And we can toggle the clock speed from 20, 25, 33 and 40 megahertz. Here are the memory modules. So these are 30 pin modules and depending on how many modules it requires to work, we can tell if it's a 16 or 32 bit board. So if it works with two modules, that means it's a 16 bit board because each module has eight bits of data. But if it requires four sticks of RAM to boot up, then it's a 32-bit board. Here goes the keyboard. It's a standard AT keyboard connector. Here a close look of the coin cell battery. And down below, this is the processor. So it's by Texas Instruments, but it's just a rebranded Cyrix 486 DLC, which is basically a riced up 386. So it plugs into a 386 motherboard. It's got an internal CPU cache and yeah, we will find out later what the performance is like. Down here are some jumpers and very interesting of course is the turbo button, but there's also a reset speaker for the keyboard lock and connecting the turbo LED. This is the chipset and it seems very highly integrated and the reason why this motherboard is so minimalistic. And also we have here the AT power connector. 
when I got the motherboard, it wasn't too dirty, but it definitely needed a bit of cleaning. So yeah, it went into the kitchen sink with some dishwashing liquid. It got a good wash and it looks much cleaner now. I made sure it dried nicely. I just left it out outside. Here in Australia, we have 40 degrees days. So yeah, it dried up very nicely. So now it was time to test the mainboard and I will just walk you through all the components that we're using in this project. The video card is first. This is nothing other than the Tseng ET4000, a very fast ISA graphics card. For storage, we've got the Goldstar Prime 2 IO controller, ID connector here, floppy port, then we've got a game port over there a serial port, another serial port here at the front, and here we've got the parallel printer port. This is the memory. We're using four modules, 30 pin memory, and each one of these has a capacity of one megabyte. They are rated at 70 nanoseconds. We need an adapter for the keyboard to convert from AT to PS2. And we also need an adapter for the power supply. This converts a modern ATX power supply to the AT standard so we can use this motherboard with a modern PSU. For the floppy drive we've got the GoTek USB floppy emulator and for the hard drive we're using a SD card with an SD card to ID adapter. At first the motherboard simply wouldn't post so I was already afraid maybe it's faulty but it turned out that this motherboard, without any memory modules, you will not hear any post beeping. So I installed two memory modules into the first two slots and yeah, then the board fired up straight away. Unfortunately, that means because it works with only two modules, that means this is a 16-bit board. It means the performance will be a little bit on the lower side. Here we can see the BIOS. It's an AMI Win BIOS, which is a graphical user interface and quite easy to navigate. I'm loading the defaults, configuring the floppy for 1.4 megabytes, but for some reason it just refuses to boot from the floppy drive. And I can hear the drive seeking. There's a BIOS option for that, but it simply refuses to boot past the post screen. Luckily, it booted fine from the SD card. I configured the capacity for the hard drive manually with 1024 cylinders, 16 heads and 63 sectors. That gives us, gives us 504 megabytes and I'm using an existing SD card which has DOS already installed. So we are off to go. Here are the results. We're using 3D Bench version 1.0 and Doom with the minimum details. I'm using the first computer lab DOS benchmark pack. Press 1 for the 3D bench benchmark and press A for the Doom minimum details benchmark. Here we have the results. I configured the clock frequencies with the jumpers at the front of the motherboard and we can see some nice performance scaling going on. Running at 40 megahertz 17.5 that is very competitive. That is faster than pretty much the fastest 386DX 40 megahertz machine. So not too bad for what basically is a 386SX machine. And if this is too fast, if you need the machine to slow down to play some Win Commander or Test Drive 3, you can reduce the clock speed and also the performance. At 20 megahertz, we're getting a 3D bench score of 9.1, I would say, that is perfect for speed sensitive games. Here we have some footage where I'm playing around with the turbo button and this is the Norton benchmark, the system information because it's live. This happens while the machine is running. At full speed, we're getting 65.1 and when you close the jumper at the front, it slows down to 35.4. And then I got sidetracked with a side quest, so to speak. That actually happens quite often and usually there's not much to talk about but in this case well yeah I'll get to it. So this is the Tseng ET4000 video card and it does have a few jumpers. There's one here, one down there, another one on this side and also there is a set of dip switches 
at the front. And yeah, I was really curious. I really wanted to find out what do these uh, jumpers and dip switches actually do. So I went online, had a look at some images and of course you always end up finding some eBay listings. And the first thing that really surprised me was the prices. Look at that, they're asking for over 300 Australian dollars. But here we can see some of the jumper settings. So that's a nice way if you're not sure how to configure the jumpers, have a look online. Maybe there's a common theme going on. I found another listing. He, uh, he's asking for a lot more, over 500 USD. And looking at the jumpers here, we can also, yeah, quite easily to identify if they are set in a certain way. I also found some information on the station.org website. So they're talking about a jumper for the weight states. So that will affect performance, but there's also another jumper having to do with the interrupt two. And I found more information on the Vogons forums. They're discussing the Diamond Speedstar 24. This is a different video card, but it's using the same Tang ET4000 chip. And again, we've got at least one jumper configuring the weight states, another one setting the interrupt two, and then there's a third jumper that's toggling between eight and 16 bit BIOS. So yeah, that gives us some clues as to what to play around with. And here we have some dip switches to do with refresh rates and retrace timings. So to find out the jumper responsible for the weight states, that wasn't too hard. I basically ran the 3D bench benchmark and just yeah moved jumpers around until something changed. And it was this jumper down below here. I have some results in 3D bench with the jumper engaged, which is zero weight states, we're getting 17.5 and that drops to 16.3 when we remove the jumper. And in Doom, we're getting 28.7 FPS, but if we uh, remove the jumper and uh, give the card a weight state, that slows down to 27.9. So it's not a huge difference, but it's definitely something you want to enable to make sure you're getting the best performance. So next, I wanted to figure out this interrupt two jumper. And my plan of attack was, well, why don't we use a device that uses interrupt two and then we should see a crash or a freeze, something happening. And then we can identify on the graphics card which jumper is responsible for disabling interrupt two. So I use the PC MIDI card together with the Dream Blaster X2 wavetable board. And down here you can see some jumpers. It uses interrupt two. And I'm testing with the game Gateway. This uses an interrupt. And yeah, unfortunately, no matter which jumpers I set on the graphics card, the game never locked up. I could hear music, it worked perfectly fine. So yeah, I had to come up with another way. So I tried a sound card. This is the ESS audio drive. We can configure it to use interrupt too. Same for the game Doom, you run the setup file set it to interrupt two. And yeah, I could hear some distortion, some buzzing, screeching going on in the background, especially when we are firing the gun. So I was hopeful that there is a conflict going on with interrupt two. Unfortunately, when I changed all the jumpers on the video card, yeah, nothing changed. Those distortions happened no matter the jumper settings. So I configured the sound card to use interrupt five and then my heart sank. Unfortunately, these interferences, they continued. And yeah, so I'm not quite sure what's going on. Some big issue with this motherboard when you're trying to use a sound card. I used another one. This is a sound card with the Opti chip also configured with Interrupt 5. And here we're also getting some screeching going on as soon as we launch the game. So very, very disappointing. So at this point, I figured out, well, there must be something more substantially wrong with this motherboard. So I had a close look and I saw a few issues. One is around the chipset. Some of the legs, yeah, seem crooked or 
uh, just a little bit off and at the back of the motherboard I can see a little bit of damage around this area here. It's not very severe so I'm not sure if this is responsible but yeah at this point I'm not quite sure how to proceed. If you have any ideas, suggestions, yeah, please let me know. I do want to repair this and then do a follow-up video. So what a shame. Maybe I got scammed twice. The first time, 10 years ago, the board never arrived and I lost my money. And this one having severe issues. So we had issues with not being able to boot from the floppy drive. And then some sound card issues with heavy interference and screeching noises when trying to play games. Recently I picked up quite a few old computer parts from the 386 and 486 era and many of them aren't working anymore and this is new. Most of my parts, well I picked, I picked them up 10 years ago and they're still working to this day so it really looks like repairing them is the way to go and that's something I need to learn. So in this uh, video we identified a few issues uh, around the chipset and maybe some traces at the back need to be looked at so yeah this will go onto a pile of other main boards that I want to repair in the future and if you have any tips or recommendations for what could be wrong with this board please leave them down below. So there you go guys this was my story of the ALD DAT4030 main board where I got scammed 10 years ago now it's back in my possession and hopefully in a future video we can get it up and running because I really like it. It's minimalistic, it's got a lovely BIOS, you can change the clock speed, it has a turbo button so in terms of speed sensitivity you can really dial in the speed for those speed sensitive DOS games. And that's it for this one, thank you so much for watching and I will definitely see you very soon with another one.